Good morning, church. Good morning. Grateful. Really grateful to be gathered here with you. Um, this morning we wrap up our sermon series where we've been reflecting on, studying, engaging, hopefully, with uh, the Holy Spirit. And um, we'll wrap up our, our time in this series together um, with, with the sermon that I'm just simply entitling Spirit-Filled Living. Spirit-Filled Living. Here's, here's my conviction. We are to have an expectancy that God's very personal, empowering presence is with us. That we, we are to have this expectancy as followers of Jesus that we really do sense God's spirit dwelling with us. We, we are to know, we are to know God abiding with us. And what that looks like in a lot of ways is that we would know what it is to hear God's voice. We would know what it is to, to know his leading in our life. We are to know what it is to delight in his presence. We are to know what it is to operate in and experience the gifts of, of his spirit. The, the conviction is, is this, is that we really would have a sense of God abiding with us. And that isn't to, to stir up, hopefully, any any points of angst or, or shame or frustration in you if you've ever stopped and, and ha have had this thought, but I don't know what it is to have God's presence leading me. I hope what, what this morning does for you is to stir up a, a, a hunger. I hope what this morning does for you is, is, to, is to stir up this understanding that there is this invitation from God that you would know what it is for him to abide with you. You would really know what it is to feel his, to sense and to experience his presence with you. But here's what I also want to clarify in that, is that doesn't mean that 24-7, 365, right, every moment of every day, you feel God's presence with you. Right? That, there, that there will be these times, there will be these daunting and even dark seasons of your life where you cry out and say, God, I've, I've known you with me and I don't know where you're at right now. But, but the experience would be this, this crying out because you sense that something is off. Right? The, the conviction that I, that I have, the conviction that I hold is that as a follower of Jesus, that you could look over the arc of your relationship with Jesus and you can declare with con confidence and conviction, I know what it is for God to dwell with me. I, I have sensed his presence. I have known him dwelling with me. I have heard his voice. I have known his lead delight. I have walked in his peace. I, I have seen him answer prayers. I have known God dwelling with me. Gordon Fee, in a book that he, or a little article that he wrote about the, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, wrote this. He wrote this about the, 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 the early church and their perspective of what it meant to be as a follower of Jesus. They, what he wrote was, what we must understand is that the Spirit was the chief element, the primary ingredient of this new existence. For them, the early church, this was not merely a matter of getting saved, forgiven, prepared for heaven, he's not saying it's not those things, but it was above all else to receive the Spirit and to walk into the new age with power. That the perspective of the early church was that, that, that to be a follower of Jesus meant that you knew what it was to have the Holy Spirit empowering your life to walk into this new age. And can I make a little caveat real quick? And let me clarify what new age is. It's this understanding that because of the cross and the resurrection, we live in a completely new time. 
we live in a completely new paradigm, a completely new reality where, where because of what Jesus has done, heaven and earth are now mingled together. That we live in, in a new era in human history where God does intimately dwell with humanity and humanity can intimately dwell with God because of what Jesus has done. That's that word new age. And for the followers of Jesus, for the early church, their conviction was, and their good news that they were preaching to the world, was it, the primary message wasn't, when you die, you will go to heaven. Their primary message was, God with us today. We have new life today. And because of the empowering of his spirit, we can actually live faithfully and obediently with full surrender and experience of his spirit. We can follow him. We can live a new life because his Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us. That was the message. You can live fully alive the very presence of God. You can have a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit. You can have a life, a day-to-day -day life that, that has this conversational type relationship with God. And what I want to do for today is, is just simply explore the question, how? How? How, how is it that we have an experience of spirit-filled life. How, 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 how do we live out this spirit-filled life? How, how do we grow in our awareness and understanding and experience of God's very spirit dwelling amongst us? How do we cultivate and see, gr and see growth in our relationship with the Holy Spirit? I want to read to you from Acts chapter 4. If you would stand with me, it'll come up on the screen. Acts chapter 4. It is a longer portion of scripture. I think that uh, Bree in the back will have to press the space bar about five times because it's that long of a passage, but I think we can do it. Acts chapter 4. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Like I said, it'll be up on the screen. It says this. While Peter and John were speaking to the people. By the way, let me pause. They... they the chapter four and chapter three, Peter and John were walking to the synagogue together around three o'clock in the afternoon, and they were going there for a time of prayer in the synagogue. And when they were on their way walking, there was a beggar that was outside of, of the synagogue of the temple, and, and they had an encounter with him in which the man was asking for, for silver and gold, and Peter says, I don't have silver and gold, but what I have I can give to you, and he tells the man, get up and walk, and this, now, this crippled man now is leaping, and you can imagine that that's causing a big stir amongst the people. So, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them. And since it was already evening, putting, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled 5,000. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? <laughs> Peter had some sass to him. Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. 
There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred amongst themselves. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they had called the apostles back in and commanded them never to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot, we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council threatened them further. But they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all of the believers lifted their voice together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why are the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The king of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your Holy Spirit, whom you anointed. But everything that they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Let's pray. Mm. Father, there is a stirring. There is a stirring in my own heart this morning that as I read a story like this that cries out and says, do it again, Lord. Do it again. Through, through a humble people where all that, that, that we hope that, that is said about us, like what was said about Peter and John, is that the people recognize these are people that had been with Jesus. Lord, continue to develop a, a hunger, an appetite, a desire for us to be a people that have just spent time with Jesus. And, and as that takes place, as we know what it is to dwell with you, to abide with you, to love and delight in your presence, that you would scatter us out through this city and county to be a people that faithfully embody your power and your presence in the world around us so that people would be made whole, so that people would be healed, so that people would move from places of mourning and desperation to places of rejoicing and delight. Would you work powerfully through your people today? Would you empower us afresh with your Holy Spirit that we might be able to be a people that go out and faithfully embody your presence to the world around us. Send your people out with new power. Fill us again, Holy Spirit, we pray. We say that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, please have a seat. I want to start with an observation. And the observation that I, that I want to bring before you is, is simply this. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit a lot. 
And actually, when you read through the book of Acts, you'll notice in the first four chapters, at least three times, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? In, in, in Acts chapter 2, when the, Holy, when the church is gathered together and they're praying together, the Holy Spirit descends upon the church, and, and Peter's part of the, all of them that were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then when the council, there's this, this just powerhouse of, of, of counsel that's standing there in front of, t- of Peter and John demanding an answer by what power, by what name they're doing these things, we're told that Peter was in that moment filled with the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of this chapter, when the church is gathered back together, we're told that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's just this really, for me, powerful communication that's happening from Luke that that there is to be this expectancy for followers of Jesus that we are regularly filled with the Holy Spirit. That we are regularly know what it is for God's presence to be poured out amongst us. And the paradigm for the church seems to be what Paul writes in in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. In Ephesians chapter 5, 18... um, Yeah, verse 18. Sorry, I missed the one there. Paul writes to the church, church, don't don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, really simple, practical (laughs) life lesson there. Don't be filled with wine. That'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And and it's been observed by, by countless people that, that the original language here that Paul writes to the church is when he says, be filled, the verb that he is using is a keep on being filled. It is this ongoing command that he's giving to the church. So the word that he writes to them, he says, don't be filled with wine. Instead, be being filled. Constant. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, it, and, it's, and it's this paradoxical kind of command that's given to the church. Because, because the paradox here is, is that, that the conviction and the confidence of the church is that the Holy Spirit doesn't go away. It isn't that, the Holy, that we're filled with the Holy Spirit and then we wake up tomorrow and we go, Oh no, I'm empty. <laughs> the Holy Spirit left me and we need to be filled again. No, no, the, the, the understanding, right, that Paul just wrote about in Ephesians chapter 1 is the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. You belong to God. He dwells with you. The Holy Spirit is, is with you as you place your, your faith and your trust in Jesus. But the paradox that we live in is, is that, that, you are, that you are filled with the Holy Spirit and as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, and then again, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's this, this constant, this constant place in which you are knowing the Holy Spirit being poured out upon your life. It is kind of like how a, a, a two-year-old fills their own cup when they are confident that they know how to fill their own cup, right? And it's this place of which they just keep on pouring and pouring and pouring and the milk just keeps on overflowing outside of the cup and you're sitting there observing this and they look at you and they say no i've got this (laughs) the understanding is is that you you would know what it is to be filled with the holy spirit and tomorrow the mercies of the lord are new every morning and as you already know what it is to have the Holy Spirit filling your being, and while he is still abiding with you, you would know what it is for him to fill you afresh. To reveal himself to you, to empower you in, in deeper and more dynamic ways. That it's this ongoing experience of knowing God's empowering presence. And that you would regularly... Again, over the arc of your life, you would regularly be in a place where you are wowed, you are floored by the very presence of God dwelling with you. You would know what it is to be filled with his power. It's 
So how, again, how, so how? Again, that's the question. How, how then do we keep on being filled? How do we posture ourselves in this, this place where we know what it is for God to, to, to pour out himself, pour out his spirit upon us again and again? And the first thing that I would have you do is just remember he's a gift. The, one of the affectionate names that the church gives the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us. In Acts chapter 4, right, in the story that we just read, the, the, the religious council asked the disciples, they brought in the two disciples, and they demanded from them, by what power or in whose name have you done this? It says that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man? Crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? And what, Paul, and what Luke is creatively doing here in this moment, where, where Peter is asked, he's brought, right, before a council on trial, and he's asked in that moment, give a defense. And what Luke is doing here is he's intentionally riffing off other things that he's already written to the church. What are things that Luke has already written to the church? Well, these are the things that he's already written to them. In quoting Jesus, he says, and when you are brought to trial in the synagogues, exactly what's happening here in this moment. And when you're brought into the trial in the synagogues and before rulers and the authorities, don't worry. Don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. Do you see how Luke is calling our attention back to what he wrote earlier? He's calling us back to the words of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will care for you. What you need to remember is that God is faithful. He's faithful. And, those, and in those moments of desperation, in those moments where you're empty, in those moments when you don't have the strength, to, to, to faithfully follow him. When you don't have enough in yourself, remember, the Holy Spirit's a gift. Not something you've earned. Not, not, not because, yeah, just that. Not, not because you've earned it, not because you have perfectly followed the Lord. But, but do you belong to him? God will show up. He'll, 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 he will show up in the times that you need him. He, he is the one that is responsible to empower you in the moment when you're weak. He's responsible. So, so how do you keep on being filled? Be weak. <laughs> Don't have enough. Be in need of a gift. Be in need of his arrival. Be, and, and so, right, in Acts chapter 1, the, the promise to the church is this. But you, you will receive power. Not you will earn power. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people all about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Church, as you are scattered throughout your, the city and county this week, as you are sent into places where you will feel like you don't have the right answers, you don't have enough wisdom, you don't know how to navigate that space, when, when you're in a place where you just go, I don't know how to handle this situation, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit will come, comes upon you. And it's up to him to be the one that shapes and molds you to be his faithful witness in this world. He's responsible. At just the right time, he will empower you. He will show up when you don't know, when you don't have enough. The other thing that I would say, so how, how do we keep on giving 
or how do we keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit, the other thing that I would encourage us to, to recall is that, that we are to be a people that give witness to Jesus. We are to be a people that give witness to Jesus. You just heard it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will be my witnesses throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But what I want to caveat about, about this, this statement, give witness to Jesus, is that it's a whole lot more holistic than we might initially think. And what I mean by that is that when we talk about giving witness to Jesus, a lot of times the, way, the imagery that we might have in our mind is that we're going around and we are preaching Jesus, that we're going around and like maybe with a sign in, at, at Petco Park that says John 3.16 or, or we randomly go up to someone in Target and just say, Jesus loves you and died for your, died for your sins, right? But, but, but listen, it's, it's, it's a whole lot more holistic than that. And, and, and the understanding for, for the followers of Jesus is that to give witness to Jesus is that we image him in the world. One, one of the prevailing themes throughout, throughout scripture is, is idols, and, and, and the understanding, right, one of the very, the, the first commandment that God gives to, to his people is don't make an idol. Or he's, don't worship other gods, second man, don't, don't make an idol of me. And the reason, the reason that God gives that command to his people is he's already made an idol of him. It's us. We're made in his image. So we don't need to make anything else that looks like him. He's already placed us in the world. That's the understanding. So don't, don't go worshiping idols because you are made in the image of God. So to so, so give witness to Jesus, to give witness to Jesus is to be sent out into the world and to demonstrate, to embody to image his power and his glory in the world, to give witness to him. And so, so when the council asks Peter, by what name are you doing this? What happens in that moment? Immediately, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. What is he doing in that moment? He's imaging Jesus. So he's giving witness. They ask, give us a defense. And I love what God does in this moment. I could tell you, but I'd rather show you. And he pours out his spirit upon Peter. And there is Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and man, the place that we get to stand, church, in this world, is we get to stand in this world as a people that have the spirit of God poured up, out upon us so that we actually look like Jesus in the world. That you're made to give witness to Jesus. You're made to look like him. And, and what, what's so beautiful about this, right, is that, that when, you, when, when Peter stands up and he gives a defense and he actually talks about what's taking place, this is what Peter says in Acts chapter 12, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. He says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Can I tell you about the context of this verse? The context that's happening here is, yes, there's no other name by, by which we can be saved. Like, there's no other way for us to get to God than through Jesus Christ. That is absolutely what Peter is saying in this moment. But there's also more to it. And what's more to it is the fact that when Peter is saying this, he's referring to a man who used to be lame and is now leaping. And Luke, when he is writing to the church about salvation, when he's writing to people about this is what you must be thinking when you think the word salvation, you've also got to be thinking healing and you've got to be thinking wholeness and you've got to be thinking deliverance. So what Peter is declaring here when he's using this word salvation, there's salvation under no one else. He's saying there's no other name that can make a lame man walk. That's what I mean when I'm saying salvation. When I say salvation, I'm talking about a man who used to be a beggar and now is standing in front of you and confounding every paradigm you have about spirituality. 
That's what salvation is. It's so, it's so holistic, right? It's this place in which Peter is saying that there's no other name by which humanity can find wholeness. There is no other name by which humanity can, can, can be returned back to a place where they are rightfully imaging God in the world. That's the understanding. It's, it, again, it's not, it's, I'm not saying that like, you, when you die, you won't be with God. It is that. You, when you die, yes, you will be present with God. But it's more than that. The understanding is, is that, that, that you would be made alive by the Spirit of God. There is salvation under no other name. Luke's, Luke's whole treaty, Luke, Luke's whole premise that he's writing to the people of God is quoted when Jesus stands in front of the synagogue and reads from the, the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of God is upon me, and he is upon me so that what? So that people would be liberated. So the oppressed would be set free. So that people would understand that now is the, the year of Jubilee. Now is the year when everything gets set right. Now is, is the new time. Now is the new age. Because the Spirit of God is here. You are made to witness, to give witness to Jesus. You are made, you are designed to embody him in this world. Every, every place that you set your feet, every place that you go, you are to remember you are designed to demonstrate and embody who he is. You are made to live in wholeness, to live in, in, in reconciliation, to live emotionally healthy, to, to live in, in, in this, this posture in life that's actually like you are becoming more loving, more kind, more generous, more, like more good. More, like you were made to give witness to Jesus, not just merely talk about him, but to embody him in the world. The other thing that I would say is how, how, how do we keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit? I would encourage us, seek the kingdom above all else. Seek the kingdom above all else. Peter's asked, Peter and John are asked, are they threatened? They're told, don't you dare talk about Jesus anymore. I love Peter's response. Peter's response, Peter and John respond and just say, you, th you, you, think, you think God wants us to listen to you over listening to him? And, and then the phrase here is we, we can't. It isn't a we won't. It isn't uh, we're making this decision every single day that we're, we're going to choose to choose to do this. It's this, our lives are so radically different, even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it. We can't. Like, I, I don't, it's almost like this, I don't know what you want us to do here. <laughs> because, like, it's like, our DNA has been changed. Stop talking about him. And, and, and I, I do believe that what Luke is doing here is that he is riffing off of the book of Daniel. It's Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. It's, it's, it's the prophet Daniel, right? It's them standing before Nebuchadnezzar and just like, you can play your music if you want. <laughs> You can, have, you can have everyone else around you bowing down before your image. We can't. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to convey it to you, just like, it's Jesus. 
It's, this is the, like, we've, we've burned the boats. <laughs> we're, we're his. There, there's no turning back. We, we, we just, do you understand what we've seen? Do you understand what we've been witness to? Like, do you understand how, like, like how, how much our lives have been changed? Do you, under, do you understand, like, the ragtag group of people that we hang out with now? And who we were and now who we are? Like, do you, do you understand how when we gather together, we look at each other's faces and just go, oh my God, God is so good. Our lives are completely different. And it's him. And it's him and it's him and it's him. And we cannot. But one of the things that I think that's also taking place here in this moment is that, that I want to maybe... Maybe for some, it'll be shifting or helping kind of rearrange a little bit how you think about this word faith. Because my, my, my growing conviction and understanding of what it is to place our faith in Jesus is being influenced a whole lot more about the language of allegiance. Because, because when you look over the gospel accounts, what you realize is that this is a, a people that are under the rule and reign of Rome, and they are being very subversive in the language that they're using when they're talking about following God. And what you find is that they even use words like gospel, which would have been a Roman word about the fact that, that there's an announcement that's now coming into a new country saying hey here's the good news about a new caesar that's coming to your land and so what the church does is like hey we're going to take that word and you may be talking about caesar but we're going to be talking about jesus our gospel our good news is that there is a new caesar that's here and and so so much of the new testament is using this language about lord king kingdom gospel and even this word faith, it's this Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. And that word, in a lot of ways, can be translated to mean faithfulness, allegiance, and fidelity. And so the, 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 the communication to, to the people, particularly, right, it's, it's initially written to a Roman world that they are being told to place their faith in Jesus that what's being conveyed to people as they're coming across this is this place that's saying, oh, I am supposed to trust in Lord Jesus and not Rome. My allegiance, my allegiance is supposed to be to Jesus. He has my allegiance. And so the communication from the gospel, right, is seek the kingdom of of God above all else. Your allegiance, your desire, your affection belongs to the king, the true king and his kingdom. That's where you reside. That's where your citizenship is. And so when Peter and John are asked, like, by what name are you doing these things? What do you, who do you think you are? Their, their response is, we belong to Jesus. He's our Caesar. He's our Lord. He's the one that has our allegiance. He, he's the one that we belong to. And we will not obey you over him. And Jesus' promise to us is what? Seek the kingdom of God in all of its righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Right? The, the, you want to be filled with his spirit. You want to have a spirit-filled life. Then the encouragement to you is give your allegiance to Jesus. And seek him in the world around you. The paradigm that you have now is like you walk around this world and you have new lenses on. And the way that you live now, 24-7, 365, is that you 
are being encouraged to have this new perspective in which you are seeing God's kingdom here on the world, in, on the earth. And you're going to be seeking him everywhere. And you're going to be in conversation with God about where's your kingdom at work? Where are you at action? In, where, you are on the, where are you on the move in this world? Because I want to see it. And I want to participate in it. I want to be a part of it. Because that's where I live now. And everywhere I step, I'm not stepping in San Diego first. I'm stepping in your kingdom first. That's where I live. That's where I reside. It's you, and it's you first. My allegiance is to you. The last thing that I would say is wait and pray. You want a spirit-filled life. You want, you want a life that is regularly experiencing the outpouring of God's spirit on you. I don't think it's coincidence that when Luke writes to the church in the book of Acts, that the moments where the church is described as all of them being filled with the Holy Spirit are the moments that they were gathered together in prayer. The church, the church, like their solution, they're, they're, they're being threatened they're, 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 being, they're being told, like, don't you dare speak about the name of Jesus. And they're seeing people, their, their people, their community being beaten and, and put in chains and left in prison overnight and being told, stop preaching the name of Jesus. And their response in these places of, of very real need and living under very real threat is just to get together and pray. They slowed down, and they just, they didn't, they didn't strategize. They didn't come up with a new mission statement. They, they, didn't, they didn't go to a, a, a church growth seminar. They gathered together, and they prayed. They knew that the it was either the Holy Spirit did something in and through them, or it was nothing. That was the solution. Church, sometimes, sometimes a holy huddle is exactly what we need in life. We, we need these, these times in our life where we get together with the people of God, and we're just, we just say, God, we want to hear your voice. We want to know your empowering. We want to know your leading in our life. Do you know a, a study was done? A study was done, and the question that was asked was, how, how many, how, excuse me, how long in an NFL game is the football actually in play? 45 minutes was one of the guests. Like, and the question was, yeah, they, they, they were trying to observe, like, how many minutes? Like, it's, so, so an NFL game, the clock is 60 minutes, right? It's 60 minutes of, of actual game time that's being played. And they started, and they just said, okay, when the, ball, like, when the ball's actually snap, either handed off, thrown, or is, like, being run around with, of those 60 minutes, how many minutes is, is actually game, like, action actually happening. Uh, 11 minutes. 11 minutes. The average, the average length, the average length of an NFL broadcast, three hours and 10 minutes. <laughs> 11 minutes of action spread out over three hours and 10 minutes. Literally, literally 5%. 5% of that three hour and 10 minute broadcast, 5% is there actually action on the field. 
what's happening in those 95%? Huddling. Strategizing. Hearing one another's voice. Meeting together. Planning. 95%. Church, we were not made for constant frantic action. We, we're, we're, not, we're not designed to be a people that are go, 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 go all the time. We're people that are designed to have action out of our rest, out of our slowing down. And the understanding that I have is that, listen, any, anything that we do in this world is, is because we have first slowed down and we've prayed. We've just, we've been present to the Lord. We've, we've been still, like we've been in these holy huddles. Like the, the solution, like, I want to live this spirit-filled life, and it, what that looks like is just me, like, again, 24-7, 365, going out and doing and doing and doing and doing in the world. No. No. Make space to be present with Jesus, to delight in his presence. Know what it is to abide with him. To be shoulder to shoulder with other followers of Jesus. And, and praying and being still and slowing down. One of the things that I'm noticing even in, in my own life is, right, there's, you could probably imagine there are scenarios as, as a pastor that there are times where people come up to me you know, after service or throughout the week and say, hey, Vince, could you pray for me? And what I've noticed in that space is that, oh, yeah, let's pray, and then I just immediately start praying over them. And just more recently, I've just realized I need to slow down <laughs> in that moment. Someone comes up and asks for prayer. And by the way, this is a heads up for you. There may be times if you come up to me and you ask for prayer that we may sit in like 30 seconds or a minute of just awkward silence first. Yeah, let's pray. And then I might just be still for a while. Because the whole point is that we're in conversation with the Lord. And I actually want to make space if he wants to say something to me in that moment. But, but like culturally and even relationally, that's awkward. Right? Like if you've ever been in a prayer gathering or if you've been in a moment where it's like, hey, let's all, we're going on a mission trip together or we're going to be doing this thing together and, and it's a space, all right, let's all join in prayer together. And you, it usually goes like, hey, Stan, would you pray first? And then after a while, I'll wrap us up. And then we enter into prayer. And then if you've ever been in these moments where there's like literally 10 seconds straight of silence, there's like kind of this awkwardness. And everyone's thinking it. Are we done? Is that, like, we've done it, right? And after that 10 seconds, it goes, oh, okay, it must be my turn now as the person that's closing the prayer to pray because we've sat in that 10 minutes of awkward silence, or that 10 seconds of awkward silence. But what if we just had this paradigm That we're a people that, that embrace silence. That even embrace boredom. Embrace not always being in action, always going. But we embrace what it was to be still 
Right? I mean, you know the passage. Be still and know that I am God. Do you want to have a spirit-filled life? Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Make space for him. Here's what I'm hoping to do. is I'm going to invite Pastor Brittany to come up to the stage here. And let's just make space. Encouragement to you this morning is Brittany, if I, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but if you would literally just repeat your worship set, and so good. You can go when you'd like. But we're just going to have this room open, let's say, for the next 10, 20 minutes. We're just going to worship. Right now, at this, or in the next, you know, two minutes, we'll officially dismiss. But if you'd like to linger this morning, if, if you'd like maybe come kneel here on the steps or at your seat, just sit, be still. For me, I like to kind of wander and pace the room a bit as I worship. But I just want a really informal space for you to just cry out to the Lord. Send your Holy Spirit. We know your presence. May, you, may we know you abiding here with us. Just enter into the space of, of worship. Um, if you'd like someone to, to pray for you in that moment, maybe you'd just like to have someone lay their hands on your shoulders and, and just pray with you for you to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. Um, you could find someone around you. Find a friend and, and ask them, hey, would you just pray that, that, that God would fill me afresh with the Spirit, that I'd know his empowering presence with me. I'd know his, his peace. I'd know his joy. I'd know his love. I'd know his provision. I'd know, I would just know him with me. So church, you could stand, you could sit, you can go if, if you need to this morning, whatever, whatever you'd like to do. But I would just would like to have some space for us just to just kind of lean in. Father, how much you love them. You encourage your people and tell them how much you enjoy them. How much you long to be filled with your presence with them. Father, I pray, awaken the hunger within us for your name. For anyone, for any one of us that has just felt like life has been stagnant, our relationship with you has going to feel like it's, it's just been really bumpy or maybe just has been really dry recently. May we see the floodgates open. May we see your resurrection power flowing through this community. May we celebrate you. spiritual posture is to be the posture of just like like really quiet subdued if, if, if it's if it's arms raised and it's like like life and it's and it's laughter and it's clapping and it's joy it sounds a lot like Jesus to me right but just enter into this space as you like um, and then leave the room whenever you'd like so love you church and be able to lean in
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, you are way maker, miracle work.
together with one breath, one voice, and one cry. Jesus, our Savior, new hope, new life, new wine. We come together. Thank you so much. 